All right, welcome to um, TED Talk Thursday. I don't know how many of you have seen this TED Talk with BJ Miller of the Zen Hospice Project yet, but he is just really a beautiful speaker. And um, this is part of the Get Ready campaign to just put our heads together and talk about end of end of life. And um, he he brings forth some great questions. He's a palliative care physician and um, has just been present for a lot of people's end of their lives. And uh, so we will watch watch the talk and then come back together and, and uh, have an open discussion about it. And I have some questions from it. So, but I would love to just, if you are okay with this, if you don't want to introduce yourself, that's okay too. But I would love to, um, to just have a quick round of introductions because I think that, you know, every opportunity that we have during COVID, especially to just build some community, even if it is on Zoom, is really worth, worth, the, worth the time. So if you could just, um, I'm going to call on people as they appear on my list here. And so if you just want to tell us your name, where you live, and, and uh, real quickly why you chose this session. So I have um, Barbara next. I'm Barbara Waters and I've lived in the Valley for 12 years now and I am a retired um, registered nurse and my life has unfortunately included a lot of death including um, two of my very um, long-term best friends last year. So death and dying has always been a hot topic in my life. So I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to take a look forward and backward. Thanks so much, Barbara, welcome. Um, I have Kim next. So if you, if you want, oh good, here you come. Hi, yeah, I wanted to say my mum and dad were both nurses and we had a nursing home. I grew up when I was about 13 to 16 living in a nursing home. So I saw lots of death um, and I was actually feeding a lady and she died on me. And so from a young age, I understood, you know, that things ended. And a lot of these uh, people in the nursing homes were people from the First World War. Um, they're, you know, they were engaged and they got their men had gone to war because, you know, that was in the 80s when I was working. So I've always known that death is, it could be there. Um, and so this is interesting because now my mum and dad are both in the 80s. So I'm kind of preparing for what may happen because they both got ill health. And uh, I live in Twisp, sorry, by the way. And my, my uh, husband and I run the RV park, the Riverbend RV park. Wonderful. Welcome, Kim. Thanks so much for joining us. Dorothy. I'm um, a actually newly retired NP as well as um, an RN. Um, I've been in healthcare for over almost 40 years and I've had the opportunity and it's actually quite a privilege to be able to talk to people about um, end of life, making some decisions and so I'm really happy to be here in the Valley. I've just newly moved here. I retired last June. And so I'm involved in Lookout Coalition and um, actually End of Life Washington as well. And, um, and hope to be um, helping with the advanced care planning facilitating. So I'm really happy to meet everybody. And I live in Mazama. Um, yeah, so glad to be here. Thank you, Tracy, for putting this on. Yeah, wonderful. Welcome, Dorothy. And we have Jeannie and folks over there, Jeannie DeBoard. Uh, but your mute is on. Yes. Hi. I don't know if you can see me. There we go. I'm uh, Jeannie and I'm a social worker with Encompass um, Home Health and Hospice. And I have our team here, which I have uh, Deb Herrero, which is another social worker and Mary Vasquez, who is our new volunteer coordinator, and then David Hodgkin, 
Hodgin, Hodge, Hodge who is our chaplain. Wonderful. And He's lives in the Met House. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, thanks so much, you guys, for joining us for this. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you letting us all participate. Absolutely. Daryl. Hi, everybody. Sorry. Uh, Daryl Dickinson. I'm a board member of the Wenatchee Valley Senior Activity Center, and we have been uh, conducting a program called the Aging Mastery Program for the last couple of years developed by the National Council on Aging. So uh, a part of the aging process is death. And so something a lot of people don't feel comfortable or want to avoid talking about, but I think it's important that we uh, you know, have a healthy perspective on this subject. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Daryl, for joining. Louisa. Good morning, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yeah, welcome. Great. Hi, I'm Louisa. I live in Wakanda and I am an end of life doula. I've been um, active uh, as a business for not quite a year now. And um, I offer a variety of services because end of life planning can start at any time. So I help with advanced planning paperwork. I can help people you know, develop whatever kind of legacy memorial they want. And I also offer bereavement visits for because um, once somebody passes and you, you have the funeral, you know, grief goes on. And, you know, our, we as a culture, um, after a while, we close off, but, you know, the person who's grieving doesn't. So um, here I am. So thank you for having us this morning. Wonderful. Yeah. Great to connect with you. Thanks for being here. Sure. Stu? You don't have to, Sue, if you don't want to jump in here, that's fine too. Are you talking to me, Tracy? Oh, I was talking to Sue Koptenak. I What's can't on? see. So, so. Oh, yeah. You're, I didn't realize, Susan, that you, you were that phone number. Well, I'll, yeah, why don't you go ahead and. No worries. Yourself. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Susan Spear and I live in Twist and um, I have been privileged to be part of a small group of women that have been meeting for five or six years to talk about loss and grief and try to study and be to grow in this area and of course a huge part of that is, is being elders and approaching death. I'm 70 but and um, in the last couple of years, there's been just kind of a constant barrage of health issues and uh, not my own, uh, just life, my husband's issues from time to time. Anyway, so um, it's been something that I just feel like we all need to work with. And um, that's probably all I can say. I appreciate so deeply all the programming that you're doing, Tracy. And um, I'm sorry, I can't see everyone, but I couldn't get to my computer this morning. So um, I'm here and glad to be here. Uh, please carry on. <laughs> all right. Thanks for being here. Michelle, Jerome. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. I haven't been talking much yet this morning. <clears throat> so I'm Michelle Jerome. I am a, I don't know, I guess I'm not retired nurse. And um, I just started recently, I came on to the palliative care team, the Okanagan palliative care team, and I'm getting oriented to that. I'm a former uh, home health and hospice nurse and um, it, it just seems like a, a lot of my work in the last decade has been around um, death and dying and um, helping people have that kind of conversation. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here, Michelle. And Alan Coco. Yeah, 
Yes, Ellen Coco are here. Uh, we're just really interested in, in all this because I think we've made a lot of plans for ourselves and we've talked to our children and we're just interested in what what's available around here and, and it's good to hear that there's people from hospice around and we're just interested in all the information. Of course, being older, we've lost a lot of friends, but uh, we're good with that. <laughs> Wonderful to have you too. Yeah, we, we need to know what our options are so we can ask for them. <laughs> so I'm so glad you're here. James. Maybe James is not available. We can always, uh, you're still on mute. Okay, let's go to Peggy. Hi, I'm just here to listen and learn. I don't know a lot about palliative care. I think I know a little bit about it, but I'm just want to listen in. And I appreciate you putting this on for us all. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Sumter, uh, and I live just outside of Winthrop. Um, and I've been, I joined a method home last year because of a fall I had. And I'm mainly interested in this because my parents had some really firm beliefs about what they wanted and what they didn't want as they got older. And in spite of that, they changed their mind. <laughs> or at least things didn't work out the way they had initially talked about it. And so I have some concerns about how I'm going to die too. So I want to learn as much information as I can. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for being in here, Sharon. Karen? Hi, um, I'm Karen Jacobson, and I'm really um, grateful, Tracy, that you're hosting these conversations um, because I I feel like um, as a community and a culture, we really need to be um, addressing the issues around death and dying um, and grief and loss. And um, so thank you so much to all of Meta at Home and the work you're doing. I'm, I'm working with the palliative care uh, team who is um, providing palliative services in Okanagan County. Uh, right now, along with Michelle Jerome, who spoke earlier. So um, glad and to be here. Well, thanks so much, Karen, for all your work, and thanks for being here. And Carlin. Hi there. <laughs> um, I'm Carlin Gunderson. I live in Twisp, and I'm just here to learn today. I really appreciate you putting this on. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, everyone. So I'm going to ask everybody to mute while we are um, watching the video, because once I put it up on my screen, I have no control anymore <laughs> to unmute anyone. So if uh, let me just looks good. And here we go. Hopefully I can figure out how to share my screen. I'm always like, is it going to work this time? And, and Well, we all need a reason to wake up. For me, it just took 11,000 volts. I know you're too polite to ask, so I will tell you. One night, sophomore year of college, just back from Thanksgiving holiday, a few of my friends and I were horsing around. We decided to climb atop a parked commuter train. Just sitting there with the wires that run overhead. Somehow that seemed like a great idea at the time. We'd certainly done stupider things. Um, I scurried up the ladder on the back, and when I stood up, the electrical current entered my arm, blew down and out my feet, and that was that. Would you believe that watch still works? 
<laughs> Takes a licking. My father wears it now in solidarity. That night began my formal relationship with death. Uh, my death. And it also began my long run as a patient. It's a good word. It means one who suffers. I guess we're all patients. Now, the American healthcare system has more than its fair share of dysfunction to match its brilliance, to be sure. Uh, I'm a physician now, a hospice and palliative medicine doc, so I've seen care from both sides. And believe me, most everyone who goes into healthcare really means well, I mean, truly. But we who work in it are also unwitting agents for a system that too often does not serve. Why? Well, there's actually a pretty easy answer to that question. And explains a lot. Because healthcare was designed with diseases, not people at its center. Which is to say, of course, it was badly designed. And nowhere are the effects of bad design more heartbreaking or the opportunity for good design more compelling than at the end of life, where things are so distilled and concentrated. There's no do-overs. My purpose today is to reach out uh, across disciplines and invite design thinking into this big conversation. That is to bring intention and creativity to the experience of dying. We have a monumental opportunity in front of us before a universal, one of the few universal issues as individuals as well as a civil society to rethink and redesign how it is we die. So let's begin at the end. For most people, the scariest thing about death isn't being dead, it's dying. Suffering, it's a key distinction. And to get underneath this, it can be very helpful to tease out suffering which is necessary, as it is, uh, from suffering we can change. The former is a natural, essential part of life, part of the deal. And to this, we are called to make space, adjust, grow. It can be really good to realize forces larger than ourselves. They bring proportionality, like a cosmic right-sizing. After my limbs were gone, that loss, for example, became fact, fixed, necessarily part of my life. And I learned I could no more reject uh, this fact than reject myself. me a while, but I learned it eventually. Now, another great thing about necessary suffering is that it is the very thing that uh, unites caregiver and care receiver, uh, human beings. This, we are finally realizing, is where healing happens. Yes, compassion, literally, as we learned yesterday, suffering together. Now, on the systems side, on the other hand, so much of the suffering is unnecessary, invented, it serves no good purpose. But the good news is, since this brand of suffering is made up, well, we can change it. How we die is indeed something we can affect. Now, making the system sensitive to this fundamental distinction between necessary and unnecessary suffering gives us our first of three design cues for the day. After all, our role as caregivers, as people who care, is to relieve suffering, not add to the pile. True to the tenets of palliative care, I function as something of a reflective advocate as much as a prescribing physician. Uh, quick aside, palliative care, very important field, but poorly understood. Uh, while it includes, it is not limited to end-of-life care. It is not limited to hospice. 
It's simply about comfort and living well at any stage. Okay, so please know that you don't have to be dying anytime soon to benefit from palliative care. Now, let me introduce you to Frank. Um, sort of makes this point. I've been seeing Frank now for years. He's living with advancing prostate cancer on top of longstanding HIV. We work on his bone pain and his fatigue, but most of the time we spend thinking out loud together about his life, really about our lives. In this way, Frank grieves. In this way, he keeps up with his losses as they roll in so that he's ready to take in the next moment. Loss is one thing, but regret quite another. So Frank has always been an adventurer. Looks like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting and no fan of regret. So it wasn't surprising when he came into clinic one day saying he wanted to raft down the Colorado River. Was this a good idea? You know, with all the risks to his safety and his health, some would say no, many did, but he went for it while he still could. And it was a glorious, marvelous trip. Freezing water, blistering dry heat, scorpion snakes, wildlife howling off the flaming walls of the Grand Canyon. All the glorious side of the world beyond our control. Now Frank's decision, while maybe dramatic, is exactly the kind so many of us would make if we only had the support to figure out what is best for ourselves over time. So much of what we're talking about today is a shift in perspective. After my accident, when I went back to college, I uh, changed my major to art history. Studying uh, visual art, I figured I'd learn something about how to see. A really potent lesson for a kid who couldn't change so much of what he was seeing. Perspective, that kind of alchemy we humans get to play with turning anguish into a flower. Flash forward, now I work at a, an amazing place in San Francisco called the Zen Hospice Project, where we have a little ritual that helps with this shift in perspective. When one of our residents dies, the mortuary men come, and as we're wheeling the body out through the garden, heading for the gate, we pause. Anyone who wants fellow residents, family, nurses, volunteers, the hearse drivers too now, share a story or a song or silence as we sprinkle the body with flower petals. It takes a few minutes, a sweet, simple parting image to usher in grief with warmth rather than repugnance. Contrast that with the typical experience in the hospital setting much like this floodlit room lined with tubes and beeping machines and blinking lights that don't stop even when the patient's life has. Cleaning crew swoops in, the body's whisked away. It's all, it feels as though that person had never really existed. Well-intended, of course, in the name of sterility, but hospitals tend to assault our senses. And the most we might hope for within those walls is numbness anesthetic, literally the opposite of aesthetic. I revere hospitals for what they can do. I am alive because of them. But we ask too much of our hospitals. They are places for acute trauma and treatable illness. They're no place to live and die. That's not what they were designed for. Now, mind you, I'm not giving up on the notion that our institutions can become more humane. Beauty can be found anywhere. I spent a few months in a burn unit uh, at St. Barnabas Hospital in Livingston, New Jersey, where <clears throat> I got really great care at every turn, including good palliative care for my pain. And one night, it began to snow outside. I remember I remember my nurses complaining about driving to it. And there was no window in my room, but it was great to just imagine it coming down all sticky. Next day, one of my nurses smuggled in a snowball for me. She put it into the unit. I cannot tell you the rapture I felt holding that in my hand. 
coldness dripping onto my burning skin, the miracle of it all, the fascination as I watched it melt and turn into water. In that moment, just being any part of this planet in this universe mattered more to me than whether I lived or died. That little snowball packed all the inspiration I needed to both try to live and be okay if I did not. In a hospital, that's a stolen moment. In my work over the years, I've known many people who were ready to go, ready to die. And not because they had found some final peace or transcendence, but because they were so repulsed by what their lives had become. In a word, cut off or ugly. There are already record numbers of us living with chronic and terminal illness and into ever older age. And we are nowhere near ready or prepared for this silver tsunami. We need an infrastructure dynamic enough to handle these seismic shifts in our population. Now is the time to create something new, something vital. I know we can because we have to. The alternative is just unacceptable. And the key ingredients are known, policy, education and training, systems, bricks and mortar. We have tons of input for designers of all stripes to work with. We know, for example, from research, what's most important to people who are closer to death. Comfort, feeling unburdened and unburdening to those they love. Existential peace and a sense of wonderment, spirituality. Over Zen Hospice's nearly 30 years, we've learned much more from our residents in subtle detail. Little things aren't so little. Take Jeanette. She finds it harder to breathe one day to the next due to ALS. Well, guess what? She wants to start smoking again. <laughs> and French cigarettes, if you please. Um, not out of some self-destructive bent, but to feel her lungs filled while she has them. Priorities change. Or Kate. She just wants to know her dog Austin is lying at the foot of her bed. His cold muzzle against her dry skin. Instead of more chemotherapy coursing through her veins, she's done that. Sensuous aesthetic gratification where in a moment, in an instant, we are rewarded for just being. So much of it comes down to loving our time by way of the senses, by way of the body, the very thing doing the living and the dying. Probably the most poignant room in the Zen Hospice guest house is our kitchen, which is a little strange when you realize that so many of our residents can eat very little, if anything at all, but we realize we are providing sustenance on several levels, smell, symbolic plane, Seriously, with all the heavy duty stuff happening under our roof, one of the most tried and true interventions we know of is to bake cookies. As long as we have our senses, even just one, we have at least the possibility of accessing what makes us feel human, connected. You know, imagine the ripples of this notion for the millions of people living and dying with dementia. Primal sensorial delights that say the things we don't have words for, impulses that make us stay present, no need for a past or a future. So, if teasing unnecessary suffering out of the system was our first design cue, then tending to dignity by way of the senses, by way of the body, the aesthetic realm is design cue number two. 
Uh, this gets us quickly to the third and final bit for today. Namely, we need to lift our sights, to set our sights on well-being. That life can become, and health, and health care can become about making life more wonderful rather than just less horrible. Beneficence. Here, this gets right at the distinction between a disease-centered and a patient or human-centered model of care. And here is where caring becomes a creative, generative, even playful act. Play may sound like a funny word here, but it's also one of our highest forms of adaptation. Consider every major compulsory effort it takes to be human. The need for food is birth cuisine. The need for shelters given rise to architecture. The need for cover, fashion, and for being subjected to the clock. Well, we invented music. So since dying is a necessary part of life, what might we create with this fact? By play, I am in no way suggesting that we take a light approach to dying or that we mandate any particular way of dying. There are mountains of sorrow that cannot move. And one way or another, we will all kneel there. Rather, I am asking we make space, physical, psychic room to allow life to play itself all the way out so that rather than just getting out of the way, aging and dying can become a process of crescendo through to the end. We can't, we can't solve for death. I know some of you are working on this. <laughs> Meanwhile, we can, <laughs> we can design towards it. Now, parts of me died early on, and that's something we can all say one way or another. And I got to redesign my life around this fact, and I tell you, it has been a liberation to realize you can always find a shock of beauty or meaning in what life you have left, like that snowball lasting for a perfect moment, all the while melting away. If we love such moments ferociously, then maybe we can learn to live well, not in spite of death, but because of it. Let death be what takes us, not lack of imagination. Thank you. Okay. It looks like we have one person who joined in while we were gone. And so welcome, I'm not sure who that is. Um, all right, I'm just, I have a lot of questions and thoughts here, but I think I'll open it up real briefly just to um, hear from folks. One thing about this talk is it is from 2015. And so I do think that there have been shifts and changes in the last seven years and it would be, Great to hear from, um, I think definitely within our valley, certainly with the, with the palliative care initiative and um, that there have been shifts and changes in the last seven years for end of life care. But anything just particularly uh, strike you out there from this talk? That's moved you in some way. I'm just going to open it up and let some brave soul come forward. I know that it's, yeah, sort of awkward on the Zoom, but. And if there's nothing general, then I'll just, I'll jump in with, um, with some of my questions here so Tracy I found one line and I'm not quoting it exactly about people are ready to die based on what their lives have become and that has such a ring of truth to me 
Mm. Yeah, I definitely think that that certainly can happen. Absolutely. Um, his statement early on about, you know, healthcare was designed with disease and not people at its center. I'm just, what, what do you all feel is true in that and maybe is starting to shift and change within the way we care for, for each other when we're <laughs> suffering with an illness or think that years ago people didn't live as long and they did die of some kind of disease you know tuberculosis different things but you know in 100 years medical have gone a long way so they have to change because we're adapting and and getting cured and and but then people get diabetes and all these other things parkinson's dementia i'm sure all of that didn't exist because the lifespan was only 100 years ago people only lived to what 36 50, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So that's why now they have to think differently. Hmm, yeah. Maybe more chronic, you know, we're dealing with more chronic diseases. I've noticed that my doctors are more responsive. Yeah, that's great, Sharon. They, they don't necessarily want you to do what you tell them you want to do, but they're at least listening to you now. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen that shift too. Not that they have a lot of time with you yet, but. <laughs> what? Medicine is sport. You know, there's still big pharma out there doing everything they can to come up with symptom relief. Mm -hmm. 